Welcome to the Unconsumed Podcast. I'm Lee Corning. I'm here with my friend, Bill Edmondson. Bill is from Chicago, Illinois, and we uh, kind of, I wouldn't call it quite grew up together because you're a little bit older than I am, but uh, we worked on some different projects. So worth talking about there. And now you found your way out to Nashville, Tennessee. So uh, Bill is the uh, Senior Director of Application Development for B2C uh, Applications at Dave Ramsey Productions. So Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Sure thing, man. Uh, so first things first is, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the Dave Ramsey program? Because I was doing some, a little bit of research online today, and it looks like Dave Ramsey has kind of quietly become one of the most popular podcasts, and that's really where it hit my radar. Yep. Um, but then, you know, I've kind of been around enough people that are financially minded through the years to find that um, Dave Ramsey program has dug hundreds or maybe thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of people out of crippling debt, right? Yep. Uh, and it's mostly based on the cash in an envelope program. It, can you describe it any deeper than that? Yeah, so uh, so you're right. Dave's um, radio show is, I think, the third largest in the nation. Mm -hmm. Something like uh, 13 million listeners-ish, you know, with change and mm -hmm. uh, 620, 625 uh, uh, radio stations um, and like you said uh, tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people he's helped um, get out of debt if not um, you know who knows how many more have at least uh, turned around their financial spending habits and really right you know he has kind of a uh, in your face uh, kind of uh, down home uh, kind of folksy wisdom about finances mm -hmm. uh, really is an attitude based thing um, you know, a lot of the things that we do with personal finance uh, aren't really very complex. We just do stupid things and get ourselves uh, in trouble uh, with money. Uh, not because we didn't know enough, just we looked at money the wrong way. And so, uh, you know, day after day, all he's doing is addressing um, our attitudes about money. You know, and he gets into some of the nitty gritty of, of uh, uh, the details on um, different types of uh, investment vehicles and mm -hmm. And, you know, on the radio show, he's, he's constantly helping people work through, you know, the specifics of their questions. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to how do we look at how do we look at money? Yeah. So having been around this for in the time you have, and I'm sure you have seen most of the episodes and you mm -hmm. heard a lot of the radio. What are the most common things that people get themselves into money issues over? Uh, well, <laughs> they buy way more than they can afford. I mean, it really comes down to that, you know, so they... Uh, their uh, their truck payment is more than their house payment, um, mm. or their yeah. You know, it's a common thing down here in the south, right? Uh, but just kind of generally everywhere, max out credit cards, um, way over buying on houses, right? Um, way over buying on cars, um, and they they just keep digging themselves farther and further into debt. Hmm. Yeah. Is there any specific items like you mentioned the car and the house? Um, is there like, is there a I don't know what the real nature of this question is, but I'm just, I'm thinking about like, are there specific things that you see over and over that people are buying and they regret? Is there any like consumer cars. decision there? Cars. cars. Yep. So they will uh, typically, especially if uh, someone's in real trouble, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing to go is the car. And it's, it's very, very common um, to someone for someone, uh, you know, having a 30, $40,000 uh, dollar, um, debt towards a car and uh, it's just drowning them. And so cars are probably the biggest one. And then, then just consumer debt, you know, so it's, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's maxed right. out. Cars. Um, Interesting. Yeah. The, the car thing is funny because I knew you best when you had, it would have been like um, maybe 2010 and you had, you must've had a 99, 98 Civic. Uh huh. Yeah. Still have I, drove thing, I, I drove that thing into the ground. Oh, okay. So it's, it's dead now. Yeah. Yeah. It died. It, oh, it died. I, uh, I, uh, my, my clutch went out on the way home and I, I got, I, I made it all the way from Palatine to Streamwood in second gear. And I, I had it about that point. And so, so that's, that's about 45 minutes in suburban Chicago traffic. Yeah. yeah it's terrible. Okay. That's so funny. Um, and so, you know, one of the biggest things that I see people mistake, make mistakes on with finances, especially with any degree of, uh, success in the marketplace is they get just a taste of the next rung up and then they go three rungs up in the car. And that's, that's funny you mentioned that one because, um, because I did it personally, I went and I bought the Audi, um, 
S5 and it's like a $60,000 car. And I thought it would make me feel cool that I drove this car because I kind of always wanted it. And it's a very cool looking car. Well, you do feel pretty cool while you're driving it. Yeah, but that lasted like until I left the parking lot. And I was like, I drove out of the parking lot and I was like, there goes 10 grand. And yep. I'll, I'm, I'm on the hook for the full 60 still. Yeah. And it, and I, Audis are great and there are guys that love cars and that's fantastic. Um, for instance, my favorite TV show right now is that uh, Seinfeld comedians in cars getting coffee. Have you seen uh-huh. that? Uh-huh. Unreal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like it just didn't do it for me. And I drive so little that it, it was like a $60,000 paperweight sitting in my driveway. Um, and at that time, it just didn't make sense. And I, I remember taking it back like a year later being like, whatever you have to do, I know that the, I've done this all wrong. Just take the car and we'll do an even trade out. I went and walked over to CarMax and I got, uh, what did I get? I don't even remember what I got, but it, it doesn't matter. It's to say like these status symbols seem to just bury people uh, financially. Yeah. How's, how's Dave say it? Uh, we, uh, we buy things we can't afford with money we don't have for people we don't like. <laughs> that, well, that, that last stanza kind of like hits the point because mm-hmm. a lot of times people are doing stuff so that they can look a certain way. And I think, yeah. I think that's something that comes with age because it's not built in automatically. Um, no, some, well, sometimes that's, it the is. Teenage, that's the teenage thing, right? Yeah. Uh, all of high school, you're so concerned about what your friends think and your entire, at least mine was, my entire life was, geared around uh did my friends like me or my you know how cool i am am i i was, I was terribly uncool so i should have just not worried about it so much um <laughs> but like yeah with the, i was just thinking with that car thing because you 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 drive around and there there is that moment i was driving my uh, aunt's jaguar uh one day and and people would kind of look over and like there was there was kind of this moment of like yeah they're seeing me in this jaguar and uh like, i'm literally never going to see this person ever again and i went to all that effort to impress them with my with my super expensive car. Yeah, and it, anyone that you would want to impress is not impressed by it. Right, is, right. Well, I don't know, so we're on the internet here, so you're talking to everyone on the planet, but it's like, yeah, there might be a few. There um, might be a few, but they're not, they're not, they're, hopefully they're not, they're not the ones that you wanna actually hang out with. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it depends on what type of person you are, or what yep. you're into. But that being said, um, I'd love to talk with you a little bit about your role. Um, so you have spent time at ticketsnow.com. Um, you were at uh, right before this. Where, were you, where was your last gig at between here what? and Ramsey? Live Nation. Live Nation. Okay. So yeah, you so spent I was in a, the media I was a, space. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've, spent, uh, I've spent my career in e-commerce, um, a couple of different startups. Uh, so uh, restaurant.com, mm-hmm. uh, kind yeah. of back in the, uh, the social deals or in the uh, – in the kind of that deal space uh, until uh, um, Groupon took over. And then um, I was at Tickets Now when they were just kind of uh, catching their stride. And, right. um, but then, yeah, the last several years was at uh, Ticketmaster uh, slash Live Nation. Okay. Yeah, so let's go all the way back because um, you, when, when, when did you graduate high school uh, off the top? 96. 96. So yep. um, I'm, I'm like – relatively familiar with that frame of life. My sister uh, also graduated in 96, I believe. So um, when you went into high school, it was 1992. The Bulls had won their first. That's right. Yeah. If, you want a, if you want a time frame for this. Um, but the thing about this is, is that, you know, you kind of had an interest in computers yeah. and, and what they could do and, and where the future was. And that was a very cool time. I remember we had a um, IBM 386 and you could yeah. load the floppy disk in there and you, you could kind of tell that this, this all had a future because it was, there was something there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I would have been uh, like eight, seven or eight for this. So <laughs> it didn't take a ton of uh, intelligence to figure this out. So what, what I think is really wild about this is at that time in the world, it would have been very difficult to get into computer programming. And so my first question is like, take me back to, you know, uh, when you found programming and and what you did to kind of get used to it and and around it, yeah. So that you know, you talk about missed opportunities. Um, mm-hmm. I loved I loved technology. Um, you know, uh, you know, growing up, any sort of gadget that was in the house uh, didn't last long around me before I took it apart and tried <laughs> to put it back together. Generally, got it back together, um, and uh, I was always kind of tinkering with things. And my 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 dad uh, 
bought us a couple computers and I'd, I'd kind of tinker around with them. Um, and I was aware of this thing called programming. Um, I didn't, I didn't really, um, I kind of thought I'd be interested in it. Um, but I, um, at the time I was just more interested. Um, you know, I spent a lot more time <laughs> playing paintball in the woods and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, I loved, I loved, uh, I loved technology. And, um, and in the back of like pop, uh, like different, um, uh, like kind of science, science magazines, um, there were there were these uh, these correspondence courses, and I always I always see these ads for C, well, learn C plus plus and learn some of these other things. I think that'd be kind of cool, um, and uh, but never kind of took that action to go uh, go explore it. Um, so in high school, I was taking a uh, a uh, stats and probability class, and uh, we had a TI calculator, and um, I was just. I was, I was bored in class or something. I was kind of tinkering with the calculator and I found this screen and, and it, and it entered, I entered this, I entered some buttons and it said if, and I was like, well, that's kind of weird. And, um, being a bored teenager with lots of time on my hands, I just started, I started entering things and I realized that I could make the calculator do things on my, on my behalf. So like I'm bored in some class, I'm sitting here and I'm starting to write programs on my calculator. Um, not realizing that I'm actually programming. With no understanding of programming at all, it was just no, like I didn't, I didn't know it was, I didn't know it was programming. I just realized I could make the I could make the calculator do things, and um, is mainly trial as trial and error. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and by the end of this uh, by the end of the semester, I was writing these very very long programs in my calculator to simulate things in my statistics class, and um, and uh, that kind of opened my eyes. I didn't I didn't realize it till a couple years later that that was programming, but uh, that started me down that path. Um, hmm. right. Now, no one told me, hey, you should go into programming school or something. You should go to comp sci school. Uh, I don't think, um, I, I'm not sure why that happened. You know, my, my, math, my math teachers uh, saw me doing this, but no one was like, hey, that's programming. You should go do this. And so I went, I went to go get a, a business degree. I was doing accounting. I was doing, uh, I, did, I did finance for a while. I, did, uh, I, I took on a, a management degree or started towards a, a, a management major. And um, I was walking by one of the computer labs and I was like, oh yeah, there's that programming thing. And so I started talking to one of the guys working in there and said, hey, could I have a, I want an account. And, uh, and uh, you know, th this stuff wasn't quite as accessible as it is now. Um, right. So you had an account on, on the, the central system or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and computer guys, for the most part, programmers love to, Kind of bring people into the guild, if you will. So, yeah, yeah. And so he set me up with an account and started showing me some things. And um, and the more I played with it, the more I realized how much I really enjoyed it. And at this point, I knew basically nothing about programming, short of I could make computers do things. And I wanted to learn more of that, so I switched over to a information systems class, uh, mm -hmm. um, or um, a master's degree or um, a bachelor's degree. Um, this is at Iowa State. This is at Iowa State, yeah. Right. And I switched over that because it was fifty percent. Um, it was fifty percent business, fifty percent computers. And uh, at that point, I had to get a degree, and I needed to make use of my uh, business classes. And so, um, and so uh, the the information systems degree was uh, kind of the the right path for me. I got to take a few C plus plus classes, some uh, some Java and some COBOL and some other things. A lot of database classes and. Uh, and um, just uh, I just felt like I fundamentally got it and just had a lot of fun with it. Right. So then you went to you went from Iowa State with a computer science degree, essentially. Uh, no, Iowa State. Iowa State. I graduated with the MIS degree, which is kind of management your, information systems. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like Excel uh, access at that point, or is, um, are you? No, no. It was more advanced than that. It just uh, it. The, it differed from a computer science degree in that um, you didn't have uh, like any of the kind of the fundamental math classes or some mm. of the more in-depth algorithm classes. Um, you, you had a bunch of business classes, and then you learned uh, you learned the uh, syntax and some of the basics of several different languages. And so you could come out, you could program. You just didn't have all the kind of the theoretical underpinnings. Okay, so then you went from Iowa State to Roosevelt and got a master's. And yeah. how, what did that, what did that process looks like? Look well, like? so I was at the time I was working for a, a, a small publishing firm full time in, in the Chicago area. I had to move out of Iowa to actually find a job at the time. Gotcha. Um, 
and uh, my my company um, would pay for a master's degree, and I kind of I kind of felt like I wasn't a real programmer yet because I didn't have that comp sci degree. So I wanted to kind of be a grown up programmer, and so I went. Um, I went to Roosevelt, um, was across the street from my uh, office, and did a part-time program um, in the evenings and weekends. Uh, took a couple of years to get through that and get some of some of the more theoretical underpinnings, the uh, more of the math classes, more of the algorithm classes, uh, that kind of thing. And did that did that really move the ball for you, or did, is that something you could have picked up on your own over time? Uh, I think. So in all, in all honesty. Uh, I think I could have picked it up on my own. Um, you know, there, there's an entire, we'll probably talk about this. Um, most of the things, especially in computer science, you can learn on your, you can learn on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you run into two problems though. One is you don't know what you don't know. And it's really helpful to have a guide. And so having someone lay out a curriculum for you and walk you through um, at least the kind of the first steps of getting into this world is, is very helpful. And then, right. And then honestly, um, you're not going to work nearly as hard on your own. I know a few people that have and, and, and really disciplined themselves. Um, but like in your early 20s, your late teens, you just like, to be honest, you don't have the, you don't have the self-discipline to push yourself kind of in the, yeah. in the same way you do as if you have a uh, looming deadline with uh, thousands of dollars behind it. You know, so if you, if you fail the class, you either drop out of school, lose that money, or you have to take the class again and spend another few thousand dollars. So it's, yeah. Uh, kind of, it's an external motivator, but it's, it works. Isn't that funny? Like that's the reason though, because like you could, in order to get exactly what you're talking about, you could put the stuff out online and then take deposits from people and say, yeah. all right, give me 10 grand. You right. can do the course. I'll yep. give it back if you do it. There's, there's companies, uh, there's companies that do that. The kind of these, uh, these uh, externally imposed, um, I'd have, to, I'd have to go look it up, but uh, yeah, there was one with like fitness and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll take, they'll take your money and then, and then either send it to a cause you don't like or something like that. What a shill though, isn't it? It's like, what a, what a fake thing. Yeah, I know. I know. But you know, uh, discipline is a hard thing. I it will say one of the guys I've recently hired though, he was, uh, he was in the, um, he worked on uh, jet engines or something for mm. the air force and uh, he left uh, he left the air force and was doing some things and decided he wanted to pro wanted to program and um, he taught himself um, eventually he went to a boot camp just to get a little more experience but right. um, it is possible you know in fact i'd say half of the developers on my team right now um, are self-taught programmers um, oh, really and they, uh, they they latched onto it and they worked really hard at it um, granted they don't, you know, they don't have, uh, some of the same background that uh, someone with a computer science degree would have, um, mm -hmm. but for, uh, for a lot of software development jobs that, that really kind of deep computer science understanding is really not all that useful. Um, mm -hmm. you know, things like communication and, uh, you know, the soft skills that people talk about. So you need to be smart, you need to know how to program and, and be a problem solver. Um, but uh, the, soft the soft skills uh, weigh uh, much more heavily um, than I would have thought in my late teens. Yeah, is that a function of uh, having that many self-taught programmers on your team? Is that a function of your management style or is that like, that's um, just the market at large? Uh, no, I like, to, I like to hire people with alternate backgrounds. Um, I found that uh, typically they have a better understanding of value. Mm -hmm. um, so if you come from a comp sci uh, if you have a if you have a comp sci degree, especially a master's degree, I think you have something um, to prove. Um, you want to do computer science, and um, right. and you're there as much for the craft as you are for making a living. And uh, at least this was, this was my experience, and I've I've worked with a lot of developers, kind of with different backgrounds, and this seems to be the case where you have a thing to prove. And unless you're unless you're doing high end computer science, you're not really doing your job. It's kind of right. kind of feeling that develops from it. And uh, that makes I, had to, sense. I had to spend a long time getting over that and like getting practical with the stuff I was doing uh, before I became really valuable um, to my company. Yeah. So after, after the, um, the Roosevelt thing, so you've gone undergrad, master's, then you, you're at uh, Tickets Now yep. and, and you decide to go for the full on MBA at, yep. uh, at Kellogg, which is Northwestern's business yep. school. Yep. So I remember this time because you had, uh, cause I, you know, when you're 
bombing around in Chicago, it's like, um, and you're in any business, there's two phenomenal business schools in town. And there's a couple that are equally, uh, you know, not equally as good, but right on par with uh, like DePaul and these yeah. other ones that are around. Valparaiso's out there. You can go over to Indiana and take a, a pretty, pretty good setup over there. Um, but they're University of Chicago and Kellogg. Yep. yep compete for a booth is the university of Chicago mm-hmm. school. They compete for the top talent in Chicago and, uh, and in the country, honestly, you know, so the top five are typically Harvard Sloan, uh, booth Kellogg, and then, you know, Wharton, um, are, you know, those, those five are typically, uh, competing for the top five MBA programs in the country. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, like I, I looked at going to Kellogg cause that's the one where they say the business folks, geared towards and then uh the technical people focus on booth which is university of chicago but you are the technical guy and then you went to kellogg so can you tell me about like a how you got into a a top school like that and then b uh, was it worth it is it is it something that you carry on and are saying like i recommend this track even understanding how much it costs, even working at Dave Ramsey, where you're always evaluating costs, uh, mm-hmm. was what was the what was what got you there? Was it worth it? And then is it still worth it now? Yeah, that I uh, I, I think about that all the time, um, and people ask me that frequently because mm-hmm. uh, you know we value so generally we value education here you know in the country, um, you know, uh, Ramsey very much values like getting things done, which. Um, if you if you can have an education and get things done, which unfortunately don't always match up, um, right? Great. Um, but um, so why did I get an MBA? Um, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of reasons that went into that. Um, some probably a little more thought through than others. Um, you know, honestly, the first thing that the first thing that attracted me to it was simply uh, so I was a super lazy student in um, undergrad, and I did. If I had to study, I just I assumed it wasn't worth it. Right. Um, and so I did just enough to get through. And I, I did fine. You know, it was an AD kind of uh, GPA, like 3.3 or something. Um, but that was like, with that, it was, no, it was no effort. I didn't put any effort. I didn't really prove anything. Um, and Iowa State's a great school. Um, mm-hmm. but, you know, honestly, I had um, uh, the capacity to do a lot of other really interesting things. That was just, I was kind of underdirected, undirected, undisciplined, and um, just kind of floated around from thing to thing. You know, I squeezed four years into five. And um, so I came out, of, I came out of Iowa State and just like, I kind of felt like I had something to prove. And, um, and so kind of all along I had planned, I wanted to go, <laughs> I wanted to get a degree from a top 10 school. Uh, right. for, you know, it was kind of like this thing in the back of my head. It was, there wasn't a real plan around it other than um, I want to prove that I can hang with really smart, talented people. Um, as kind of this um, kind of the self fulfillment kind of thing, and so that's what got me thinking about it. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I think what really kicked it off for me is when when you and I kind of uh, went on. Uh, we, we tried to start that that, that tech startup. And yeah, let's talk about that at, right after this because yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, I was and queued so, up on that. And so and so, like I, you know, as any good tech guy, I know software, and so you start by building things. And I built a bunch of stuff and then, and then the time came to do like businessy stuff and I'm like, I had no idea what to do. And mm-hmm. so I was like, well, I'll build some more stuff. And, and so I built some more stuff and then it's time for some business, businessy stuff to do. And, and I'm like, I, I, every time I stepped into this business world, I felt like I didn't, um, I didn't know anything, which was, right. um, you know, software developers, you know, we, we think we're smart, right? Because we're doing kind of hard things that um, a lot of other people don't know or don't understand. It's a bit of a um, black box for people outside of software development world. It's a, um, it's almost this dark art, you know, where you, you have these incantations that you type up on these dark screens in the dark room and you're the wizard of the computer. Right. And, um, and you kind of have in the back of your head of like, wow, I'm really smart. People are always telling me how smart I am. Um, and they're always so impressed with my skills. Um, all this other like business stuff is probably really easy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, really the tech, once you have the tech, it's going to sell itself. And, uh, that was kind of the assumption in my head. Um, at the time I didn't realize that was my assumption, you know, but after a few years of thinking, you know, kind of, uh, retrospecting on this, I realized that that was kind of what was going through my head. So, right. you know, as we're, as we're trying to do this startup, um, I kept running into this brick wall of all this business stuff. 
that I didn't understand. And I was like, I got to fix this because, you know, I'd always pictured myself running a business or something along those lines. And so I started reading a bunch of books and, uh, you know, podcasts weren't a big thing yet. Um, but I was reading a lot of books and, and then eventually I was like, you know what, um, if you want to learn things, you go to school. And so, um, I was like, well, who are the best business schools in the area, in the country? And I started two are in your backyard. Yeah. Yep. And it turns out two of them are, were downtown. And, um, and I didn't think a whole lot about the cost of it. Um, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll make that up on the other side. Uh, and, um, so you, you footed the bill for it. This was yeah. not company nope. sponsored. Nope. It was not company sponsored. Would they charge you for the full yeah. program? hundred K is a little more than that. hundred, hundred five or something. Gotcha. Yep. So now that you're on the other side of it, could you, could you be in the role that you're in now if you didn't have the Kellogg MBA? So, so you're asking what the alternate future would look like. Um, yes. So, gosh, um, I, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I will say that, I will say that my, my first management job was a direct result of my Kellogg MBA. Okay. Um, you know, so, you know, I did, look, I worked really, really hard and I, I met a lot of really smart people that pushed me and my professors pushed me and, um, you know, there, there was no rest for a couple of years because right. all I was doing was going to class and studying. And then I was doing this part-time while I worked full-time. And so, um, and you had very young kids at the time. <laughs> I did have young kids. Uh, I had a great wife who, uh, who, uh, supported me through this process. Um, yeah. and, um, so I learned a ton of things that um, I wouldn't have known otherwise. And I pushed myself in ways that I wouldn't have otherwise. And, you know, honestly, from a, a personal branding perspective, I have the Kellogg name on my resume. It's, it's great personal cachet. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, uh, software de developers especially will kind of uh, turn their nose up at that of like, you know, judge me about what I can do. Um, not by, you know, what my resume says, but right. There, uh, there's some truth to personal branding and, uh, and you need to have something backing you up, you know, and, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, a great company that you worked, worked for and kind of grew through the ranks or, you know, something you invented, um, or great references. Um, you have to have something that can, that can kind of accelerate some of these things. Otherwise it's, a, it's, it's certainly a long slog, um, getting over these hurdles and, right. you know, in many ways, in many ways, um, you know, while you learn tons of things at places like Booth and Kellogg, it's a really expensive vetting, vetting process. Um, and um, it's not the final word in what you can do, but if someone looks at your resume and they say, oh, wow, he has a Kellogg MBA, um, they have a, at least an understanding of the work that you had to go through and, and a, a relative sense of uh, your level of intelligence. Um, because, uh, you know, there's, there's things for getting into the school, you know, whether it's your, your, previous GPA, your GMAT score. And then honestly, some of those classes are really, really hard. And, um, and if, if you don't have the ability to uh, think, you're not going to make it through the entire program. And so right. it's, a, it's a, along with education, it's honestly, it's a vetting, it's a vetting system. And, and it helped me get my first management, management job. I went from a, I went from a uh, team lead. Um, so um, a team lead, um, just kind of make sure that the tech is in line and that um, the, the, the tech strategy that we're using is appropriate, but there's no real like people leadership going on. I went from that to um, uh, three teams of, of like 13 direct reports or something. And okay. in large part, in large part, it was based off my MBA. You know, I had some good discussions with the VP of technology at the time. He was getting uh, his uh, executive MBA from Kellogg. And so we had some commonality that we were able to connect on. And, and it wasn't, look, it wasn't just a cronyism thing where like, oh, you're going to the same school as me. Um, but he understood the rigor of the program and how hard it was to get in. And, and that you funded it for yourself, I guess. I mean, yeah, and then I funded it for myself. Yeah. Funded by himself. Right. Yep. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. So it got me, so it taught me a bunch of stuff. It got me my first job um, uh, probably much earlier than I would have on the trajectory I was on. Okay. Um, and so it definitely accelerated some things for me. So net net, the MBA can be worth it, especially if it's yeah. from one of those top schools. Yeah. So what I so the, when people ask me about this, and periodically people will reach out to me about this, either just like um, cold calling off of LinkedIn or um, you know people I know. And so I tell them a couple of things. One is, 
if you're going to get an MBA, um, it's as much about the work that you put into it as it is like the degree itself. So, um, you know, the studying and the learning. Um, I knew, oddly enough, I knew a number of people in the program that um, did put in the effort um, and uh, realistically weren't getting that much out of the program, which was bizarre to me to uh, spend that kind of money and uh, that much effort and uh, not actually learn something. Um, and there's a lot of connections that you need to be making there, um, you know, beyond just kind of the academics. And so um, yeah. the value of the MBA um, is tied up in, in how much you engage with that program. If you're going, if you're going into it just to get the, get the MBA, to get that, um, that diploma at the end, it's not worth it for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a couple areas if you're going into, I think it's very valuable. So um, in particular, uh, uh, consulting, it's often very valuable to uh, be at Booth or Kellogg um, right. or, or, you know, Harvard where they won't even, they won't even talk to you um, unless you have one of those degrees. And in, in a lot of areas in finance, it's very important um, to have that degree, especially a finance degree from a top 10 business school. And so there are a couple areas where that's critical. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I bump into the consulting world all the time and it seems like every single one of those guys, they must all just like got in the same bus and landed in um, Boston somewhere and went to one of those schools and yep. then they bus them all around the country again. So yep. that's, that is, there's some truth to that. Um, so let's, let's take it from here is to say when you went from tickets now over to, to Ramsey and you're now you're managing not just one team, uh, but a, a, a duplicitous teams, I guess would yeah, be the term, several, yep. several teams, and you're creating these applications. Actually, let's back it off. Let's put a pin in that. Let's talk about tophat.com, which was our startup yeah. idea that we had. Before you go on that, I just wanted to say one more thing about like whether you do the MBA or not. Okay, yeah. Um, so funny enough, the, uh, the most critical lesson that I picked up from my MBA, and this is total common sense, but for whatever reason, like we don't automatically get it, it's mm -hmm. opportunity cost. And so if you're considering getting an MBA, do the alternate say, what if I took that hundred thousand dollars and invested it somewhere? Or what if I took that hundred thousand dollars and hired a professional coach or, or half of that? Um, what kind of opportunities there? And I think, I think in retrospect, taking that for a hundred thousand dollars, there's a lot of really interesting things that you can do um, rather than spending on college tuition. So before you go into the MBA, take some time analyzing what you would do with that money. Now, if your company is going to pay for it, it's, I think it's kind of a no-brainer. You go ahead and do it. Um, it's going to be a lot of work, um, right? But it's totally worth it at that point. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to wrap up with that. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of peers go through these top schools, and it is very difficult to get yourself to the office, and then after work, oh, get exhausting. yourself over to the program, mm -hmm. and then get home in time to study and get your things yep. done. And then, Oh, by the way, you got a full day of work tomorrow. And if you have a family at this time, it's, it's quite taxing. So yep. uh, just something to have in mind if you're thinking about doing this. Yep. Uh, the other thing is, so I wanted to talk about top hat. So uh, you and I had a, a business venture. I was a trader at the Chicago Mercantile exchange at this time. And, and you were at ticketsnow.com, which is, um, you know, it's, it's essentially an auction or a bidding site for event tickets. It's like StubHub or RazorGator. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so secondary ticket market. There's a, there's a, there's an auction system or a bid, yeah. to, bid to offer system going on in the background yeah. of these apps. Mm -hmm. So we were like, all right, so um, let's figure out a way where we can take, uh, what are they called? Those, you get those cards and they have charge on them from loyal, different loyal, loyalty cards. So this is okay. So this is what was happening. Loyalty um, cards and yeah. gift cards. Yep. Sorry, that took me yep. forever to get yep. that out. So we were always, we, so I love talking with you cause like you, you, like you have like a thousand ideas a minute. And so we were always talking business opportunities. Yes. And I was sitting, I was sitting at a coffee shop one day with my wife and I was kind of going through my wallet and I pulled out the stack of loyalty cards, you know, with little punches. <laughs> um, and like, while I'm not a minimalist, I don't like carrying a lot of stuff with me. And I was just kind of annoyed that I had the stack of cards with me. And so you I, had so the George up. Costanza wallet going on. Right, right. Yeah, it's giving you back problems. And so I called you up. I was like, Lee, this is what we got to do. And I had no idea what, like, where it was going to go. But I was like, I want to get rid of these loyalty cards. I want to make them digital. Yeah. And so this would have been like 2008 or nine. So if, right? 
It was, uh, it was, it was definitely, it was mid 2000s somewhere. So it was after 2005. So 2005 to 2008 somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe earlier than that. And so if you're remembering that time in the world, yeah, the, the loyalty cards and you had the habit on hand for them to punch it. Now everyone's got an app, yeah. but it, it was before it's time. And so two, two things that are funny here is that a, the, the company was called tophat.com mm -hmm. Cause it was available and it was phonetically right. correct. It was, it, was, it, was it, was about the, it was about the only proper noun that we could buy um, that didn't cost us $10,000. Yes. And now there's a site called tophatter.com mm -hmm. where they, it's yeah. a bidding site. Yeah. I see, I see the ads for it all the time. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I think I still own tophat.com. Oh, funny. If we ever want to like okay. pawn that we, off. We, we need to resurrect it just for the fun of it. And, and then the other piece of it is we talked about the gift card component. So like, mm -hmm. If you're standing in a, a trading pit or you're in front of a screen where there's bid to offer going on worldwide, yep. in theory, you could apply the same principles to like what a dollar is worth at GameStop as opposed to what a dollar is worth at Nordstrom's, right? Mm -hmm. Or even Amazon. So if you're if you're if you're being honest with yourself and you're thinking about valuations and you think GameStop may go out of business or the store in your area might shut down. Or like, think of what a, a dollar at Blockbuster is worth w right before Blockbuster goes out of business. And I'm not saying GameStop's going to go out of business. I know a lot of good people there. They're, I love going to GameStop because that's where I get to see all the stuff. Yep. That being said, um, a dollar at a specific retailer fluctuates in value. And if you could take the gift card values, turn them in, and then have them in on an account, and you could shift values between people when, when the new Grand Theft Auto game comes out, a dollar at GameStop might fluctuate up a few pennies. Yep. Or if um, Nordstrom is closing its, uh, its store in your area, then in theory, the, the value to you personally goes down on Walmart, but the rest of the, or Nordstrom's, but the rest of the market still perceives it the same. So yep. naturally there's an arbitrage here and I was thinking, let's do that. This could be really cool. We could build in all of the loyalty components as well. You could have an app, you could sit there like uh, maybe you would on a video game and mm -hmm. just watch these markets uh, transpire in front of you like I was doing all day anyways. And we hit a point where, where yeah, you had, you, you had described it a little bit earlier where you were saying, okay, so let's, let's like figure this out. I keep running into all these business problems. And then you went the MBA route. If we were replaying that as, as Bill Edmondson is today, mm -hmm. do you think we could have done it? Because no one's done it well yet. Yeah, I don't, gosh. Uh, so again, this kind of goes back to like, what do you, like you forget all the things that you learned along the way. Um, right. I think, I think, I think right now going back with what we know now, I think we could have, I think we got to got something off the ground. I think it probably would have just knowing the market and having seen enough, these loyalty pro, uh, programs come and go. Right. Uh, it probably would have pivoted into two or three or four different things before it landed. You know, in fact, uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends uh, from Kellogg um, after we graduated, he, he, he tried to start up, he started down the road of some sort of gift card exchange. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about that and then he, and then he pivoted out of that and into some sort of like a, um, like a social, like data mining, like ad space. And then he yeah. changed out of that into something else. Um, and, uh, and now he's VP at some company. He's, he sold his company. Um, so oh, he was successful and sold it. Yep. Good for him. It's, it's, uh, it's Eric. It's every house. Yep. He's coming on the podcast, so we'll get oh. all the details on that. Great, yeah. So yeah, at one point he was, I think, I think if I remember right, he was starting the, um, he he started looking at a gift card exchange, and we had a short discussion about it. And uh, he moved, and I didn't talk to him after that, um, but uh, uh, he uh, he pivoted out of that for whatever. Well, for probably a lot of the same reasons we found is that people don't think in terms of arbitrage, and um, and there's a lot of hurdles kind of in that gift, gift card space for really what's relatively low values. And so, yeah, so it, all, that, all that to say is no, I don't think we would have made that float, uh, but I'm sure we could have come up with something out of that. Yeah, I think the loyalty program at that specific time could have picked up an MVP and mm -hmm. then you could have an app that essentially controls all your loyalty programs. Yep. And then that's easily remarkable. So I think when I, when I remember that, I remember okay, we could have done something there. Yep. Um, so that's interesting. Tell me a uh, tell me a 
an idea that you have right now that you wouldn't mind giving away out to the internet at large? Do you have anything oh, on it? Uh, so come back to that. Let me, I, I'm sure I have a couple. Um, we'll, we'll right. come back to that. Yeah. So wait, you say come back to that or you got yeah, something come, to say right now? No, come back to it. No, let me think about it. Uh, I, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about it in advance. I do have, let me see if I can find something here while we talk. Yeah, so. I, so I keep a running list of things. Okay, well, you're digging it up. I, I read this book by James Altucher. He's a famous podcast guy. And he has this, uh, this he calls it the idea machine. And you're supposed oh. to come up with 10 ideas a day on anything. And as oh, you cool. move along, you come up with 10 ideas that are more fine-tuned mm -hmm. to a specific category. And so every day, and you mentioned I have a thousand ideas, it's because every day on my iPad here, I pump in 10 ideas on something. Yeah. And then well, he, he's also big into giving ideas away for free. And so there's no freer way to give away ideas than on a YouTube video or a podcast, you know? Yep. Well, and that's, that's the, uh, that's the thing I've always loved about you, Lee, is like you will, you will come up with the most crazy, <laughs> <laughs> like wildest idea and like, and you will just like run with it and, uh, and, and spend some time on it and throw a little bit of money on it and be like, ah, that's not going to work. And then you'll move on. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know this is uh, this is one of the big problems in uh, software developer lands. Uh, land is uh, software developers are. Um, have, you, have you heard of the disk profile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they tend to be high C, so which means they like details and they like to be have everything lined up and they want to know all the facts before they take any sort of action, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so they'll plan, 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 um, or you know, aim, 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 aim. You know, ready, aim, and. And uh, like, like all the Lee Cornings of the world are like, come on, dude, just pull the trigger. Let's see what happens. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's give it a shot. Yeah. So, it it's shot. Fun, so you're talking about the disc profile. So yeah. disc profile is uh, it's four quadrants and you kind of score on this essentially a circle and it, uh, it starts D is dominance. I is influence. And then uh, S is what? Uh, uh, so gosh, what does S stand for? It's, um, your, your interpersonal. So it's a, it's a two by two matrix is really what it comes down right. to. And it's task driven uh, versus people driven um, kind of going um, kind of going left or right on the uh, X axis on the Y axis. It's kind of like, like, like externally focused at, at the top of the Y axis and then internally focused on the, uh, on the bottom of the Y axis. Mm -hmm. And so, and so um, kind of those top two quadrants are you have the high I people kind of like your salesman um you know they they uh, love to meet everybody they love to talk um very very external very very people focused whereas you have the the high d kind of your typical like type a personality very driven very task oriented i mean they'll run over people without really intending to just because they're you know they're um they're very driven um so if you look at the software developers though they're very task oriented but very internally focused and so they, uh, they, um, they're not going to rush into something and they're not going to, um, they want all the details before they, mm -hmm. they make movement. And like, this is just kind of, this is, it's a stereotype, but it's a real stereotype. Yeah. Um, if we're going to fight against something, it's actually moving quicker uh, rather than um, waiting until we have all the details. Yeah. So net net on this, if you look at the X axis, programmers and operational people fall south of the X axis and yep. Business people and salespeople fall north of the x-axis. Typically, so, yep. yeah. I'm like right on the line between I and D and yep. high up there. So yep. when when you and I are working on a project, you could see how there might be some like miscommunication. Not not miscommunications. I think we both communicated quite well. Yep. Uh, but there can be differences in how you view the world. Oh, totally. And this is. So this is what I tell my uh, uh, team members all the time. And, you know, if we're in this kind of like career oriented discussions, um, the hardest thing about software development, it's not the software development. It's these kind of communication um, problems. And, and like I have all these ideas in my head and I have to kind of translate them somehow in a way that you're going to understand. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you're on the opposite ends of the spectrum like that, like you, you can't help but almost like look at this other person, you know, says a software developer, they look at someone like you and they're like, that guy, like he glosses over all the details. And he's kind of a jerk. And, and, um, you know, I start thinking bad things about, I know, you right? You call me a jerk? Yeah, I am. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. And then, um, and then, received. <laughs> and then all the, and then like all the guys like you are looking at the software developers and they're like, can you just like, 
like get something done like get it out there let's see what's going to happen like we don't need to have all the details and just like we'll figure it out later and mm. uh, and there's there's extreme value in both sides and as soon as you realize there's just kind of two sides of the same coin um you know they're, they're both a strength and a weakness there's right. there's huge strength and it's like going out there and trying things and getting them done um but if the entire world was was people like that um just trying to get things done and 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 throwing stuff against the wall to see what stick they, they would they would never progress past that point and, and everything would be a mess it's all the kind of these high c very detail oriented people that come and rescue people like yourself from yourself you know so that's uh uh, Dave Ramsey is is a is high D high I you know he's kind of off the, the 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 spectrum in that area, and it took him a long time to kind of like dial in like how do we how do we run this entire tech department because he you know he wins by knocking walls down and and um and there's been kind of this learning process as the company grows about like how do you balance this robust technology stack with um, this very entrepreneurial um, we don't know where we're going yet, but we're gonna, we know we're going to figure it out, and um, we're going to win through force of will um, rather than rather than planning. And I think we've really hit our stride in that. You know, we're at um, so we've really been growing over the last few years, and there's this good balance between this entrepreneur chase things down, you know, run out, kill it, drag it home, and eat it, um, and like we need a we need a long term plan. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a tension that has to be constantly managed. You don't really solve it, I don't think. Yes. Yeah. So let me tell you this. So I've run, I've run a couple small things and, yeah. and had a lot of success with them. And so remembering the time when we started Top Hat to yeah. where I am now, the high, the high D, high I's absolutely need the S and the C characters to make yep. anything that has any staying power. But yep. the S and the C characters won't do anything without the high I's and high D's. So yep. it's, you need the business person and you need the development stack and there needs to be some give between the two of them yep. so that the, the operational and development person can build something that they're happy with, but then also the, the business can go then sell. Yeah. There, so, there, there needs yeah. to be some, there needs the, the high D high I person needs to be able to get some things out in the marketplace very early to do some testing. Um, and the, the, the 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 operational people need to have trust in their high D counterparts that they're going to get a chance to come back and do some iterations to do some improvements on this because too often what happens right is you put the thing out there like oh it's temporary it's temporary and it and this temporary thing actually becomes the core of the company and you know for for literally decades afterwards you know you're you're running off this this terrible infrastructure because you never took the time to come back and do those iterations and there's some trust issues there that have to be worked through. It's so funny you say that because I've worked with uh, several companies that are north of $500 million in revenue and they're running their yep. entire business off something that was just a prototype. Yep. And, hey, it's not a bad thing if you turn your prototype into a $500 million business and just keep slapping band-aids on it all the time because eventually, you can overhaul the whole thing and have a really run a uh, smooth running process. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's this dance. I call it the dance between order and chaos uh, yeah. for, for business in the, the dev side of the house. And I'll, I'll take this uh, and throw it, throw it left to here a little bit is that I also think, you know, politically we have the same dichotomy in the world is that you've got uh, left and right and they want to win so badly for their own cause. Sure. But, if you go too far right, there's huge problems there. And if you go too far left, there's huge problems there. And so if you're building a company, you have to realize that both sides need each other to create some middle ground and create some, some linking. Because uh, if you could even look in the last 100 years of human history. We've gone too far right some places. We've gone too far left some places. And both are catastrophic. So if you're looking at your business, you can say, if we go, if we go all in on the sales side of the house and we go all in on the business, we're going to blow up if we go all in and we just make, we, we sit in our basement and we create the most perfect product ever mm -hmm. and then never take it to market or not well. Mm -hmm. uh, or th this is something I think is hilarious is that the, the development side of the house 
will look down at the marketing department. <laughs> I know, right? I just, 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 just spray some advertising on it. It should be fine. Yeah, do, we'll do AdWords. Like we can yeah. do that right here, right? Right, right. Like, well, what's the big deal? Well, you know, I was just, I was talking with uh, with a friend of mine. Um, he's trying to, um, he's uh, helping a uh, kind of rescue a startup here, uh, a medical startup in the. Um, healthcare startup in the Nashville area here. And one of the things that happened was um, they, they scaled up very, very quickly in sales and in, and, um, in one other area, it didn't scale up enough in a couple of other areas. And so they were way overbalanced and, and they, they burned through a bunch of money on a bunch of positions that really, it wasn't time yet to kind of have these roles in place. Right. And, and it's really hard to know in, in, in advance. Um, it's impossible. It's, it, well, it's not impossible, but it's, you know, it takes an educated guess in a lot of times too. Yeah. And we, you know, I call it, I call it opinion based development in the software world where, where right, like your, your, every feature is based off of the opinion and typically the loudest opinion in the room. Mm -hmm. And, and pretty much always that opinion is wrong or mostly wrong or not right enough that um, very few people are that visionary. Um, you may think you're Steve jobs. You're not. Um, there was one Steve Jobs, and, and he's gone. Um, the rest of us have to uh, uh, go try things out and see what the result is. Uh, we're not that smart. Yeah. You know, the other thing about that is um, one of the things that has entered the market in the last 10 years is uh, opinions backed by data. And so sure. someone will walk into a meeting, and they'll, right. they'll bring a, a data set, and they'll, they'll show weaponize it. They'll weaponize it. Yeah. And it does – and so if – it's matured to the point where people can also manipulate the data. Yeah. Like that's statistics 101. I can make this data say whatever I want, or yeah. I can make the chart look like this AB test was the most insane jump ever, but it's really not, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, right. right. You, you, you format the, the, the chart purposefully to lop off some of the data. You leave some of the data out. You, um, you, uh, you change the angle of it, you know, use a 3D pie chart, like look how big this section is and really, really, really it's, yeah. uh, it's not showing what you're indicating. Yeah. So I, I take this to like, it's just another aspect to the conversational communication play that we have internally at these, at these jobs that we're at is you need a, it's a non-starter if you don't have the data. And yep. then it's, it sure helps to be loud and have a title. And then uh -huh. third, I think the, the cherry on top of all of this is it's that the most confident person with the data and the title will win the conversation. Oh, sure. And so, well, and so look, but theory, theoretically, sorry, I'm totally cutting you off, but theoretically, um, it's the internet, we got nothing but time, Bill. <laughs> we have nothing but time. Yeah. I've heard you say that before. Uh, <laughs> um, so look, there's the stereotype of the clueless boss who, uh, doesn't, you know, who, who got to his place through accident or through, um, nepotism or something. And I know that exists. Mm -hmm. My experience has not been so much that. Yeah, I've, I've run into some clueless people, but most of the most of the executives that I've I've worked with closely, they got to that position because it turns out that they're really smart and they work really hard, and mm -hmm. and they're not right all the time. They're right, they're wrong a lot of times, but um, they're uh, they're right more often than they're wrong. And like in terms of in terms of opinions, you should listen to in the room. It's typically them, you know. So it's not an accident that they're in that position. We shouldn't necessarily look down on the fact that it's their opinion that gets chosen. You know, they've, they've put in, they've put in their, uh, they've put in the effort and they've proven, them, proven themselves um, as opposed to say, uh, you know, 20 year old me just uh, brand new from college who thinks he knows everything because mm -hmm. he's programming for a couple of years and I have no experience to back it up. And um, it can really make a calculator hum. Right, right. <laughs> Look at this calculator. Look what I can do. Like, I'm obviously very smart. You should listen to me. Like, there's nothing to prove. There's nothing to prove that. Yeah, you know, one thing I think that management gets a, a tough wrap around is, in it's viewed as innovation stifling. Is that there's a risk management play that comes yep. in the balance because if you're working at a company that has something going that is gaining traction, and then you've got someone in that just wants to flip everything over. It yeah. can be seen as innovation stifling to say, no, no, we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to continue on this path because this path shows that we've got some traction here. What, yeah. what I would say to those people is if you want to tip the table over, like go try to tip over the table on your own dime. Go, go yeah. start your own thing on your own time. Right. And see what right. you can do. Yeah. Like, are you willing, are you willing to bet a hundred thousand dollars of your own money that you're right? No. And the answer is almost yeah. always no. You're not, you're not. And, and you just, and you don't have 
um, you don't have the perspective, um, you know, so the higher up in the order you are, the more, the more things you're trying to balance and you have, you have public perception and you have, you have to balance the checkbook at the end of the month. And, right. and uh, you know, there's, there's a hundred things that you have to take into balance. And, and in the process of doing that, you're, you're going to take something away from someone, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the bigger the company gets, the less access you get as a technician, right? So we, we, in a small company, you get access to all the production servers and you have all the passwords. And as the company grows, they'll start getting taken away from you. And it feels, it feels very weird to lose that control, but there's other factors kind of coming into play here. Um, and as soon as you start thinking in terms of what are, what are all the motivations of, of this person? You kind of get a, you get a, uh, if you can put yourself in their headspace, um, you start understanding, like, oh, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more at stake here than I'm realizing. And really, right. honestly, you don't, you don't really understand that until you actually have to lead something. Like you think you understand it. And then as soon as you have to lead something and people are arguing with you and, and contradicting you and not helping with the mission, like you get it. Um, that first leadership job is kind of, uh, kind of eye opening. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to uh, younger developers that are coming up through the ranks and they're building things that they aren't necessarily thrilled about, but that it's the job that they're in now. Yeah. But then there's this future for them. What do you, what do you tell them? Oh, I, so I have a, I have a list of things. Um, yeah. And I, I, honestly, I, I, I gear a lot of them in personal experiences, but um, there's a lot of listening that goes on. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, kind of with listening is some humbleness that you may not have the full picture. Like, I get it. Like, you're top of your class. Um, right. uh, but for all those things you learned in school, um, there's a million other life experiences that you have that don't back that up. And so you may be able to write the most, most um, powerful algorithm or, or, um, or whatever it is. Um, but, like, you don't, there's so many other things that you just don't understand because you haven't been exposed to it. So there's a lot of humbleness there. Um, and there's this matter of be patient, excel where you're at. Um, like I get it. You want to grow, you want to make more money, you want promotions. Um, those, those things, you're not going to get the next step unless you're doing good at where you're at. And, uh, mm -hmm. I was, so this was me. I was always in a rush for the next thing. Um, I, yeah. I always wanted that next promotion. I'm like, why haven't I gotten that position? And, um, but I kept, I, I kept forgetting the fact that I needed to be doing really, really good, um, where I was at. And then once I had that mastered, then start stepping out into some other areas. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't, uh, you, um, you can't jump past that. Excel where you're at. Yeah. So one one thing, and I picked this up at Amazon. I hadn't heard it before I was over there. And it is try to be doing the job that you want to do while you're in your current job. And and this is um, well, it just makes the decision so much easier when it comes time. You say, you know, hey, the job's open. You're already doing this here's your stamp. You got a new title, go over to HR. They'll give you a few more bucks. So they um, have to have, they have to have your, your, the, the people, there's a lot of fear in promoting someone. You know, I think about this constantly when I'm promoting someone is like, can, can I trust them to get things done? Um, do I have to, do I have to give feedback on every little thing that they're doing? Um, are they thinking through all the, are, are they thinking through um, all the considerations here? Um, but ultimately do I trust them uh, to do the work? And yeah. um, there's a lot of things that go into that, you know, uh, from like integrity, like do you do the right thing when no one's watching? Um, do you follow up? Do you, do you think two or three steps in advance? Um, do, you, do you take things off my plate? Are, are you demonstrating the fact that um, you can do some of the things that I'm doing, um, whether that's running meetings or resolving conflict or, you know, right. or, or running a project or uh, keeping a project on track. And, and you don't do that all at once. You pick one thing and you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my job and then I'm gonna take this off my boss's plate and we'll have a talk about it and, um, and we'll figure out how the best way of doing that. Like, just don't go off and do it on your own, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but, hey, Ariel. Hey, sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, so take things off your boss's plate. Yeah, so what would you, what advice would you give the business in relation to how they deal with the development team? Because it's, you know, in this would, we can use your and my interaction when we were very young doing something on their, on our own. Yeah. Uh, what would, what advice would you give to the management side or the, the business side of the house? So, 
So it's the, it's the same thing. It's, it's just going the other way. What are the motivations of developers? Um, especially you, your, your stereotypical developer, um, they want things to, they want to know that things are orderly and they want to know that they have a chance to come back and um, exercise their craft, not just for the craft sake, but for mm -hmm. the sake of making good solid systems. So we get honestly as much enjoyment out of uh, developing something well um, um, as we do, <laughs> unfortunately, the output of the, of the, of the thing that we built. And, yeah. Um, but like there is, you know, there's stability things involved with that, you know, so we have, um, uh, so this is what happens. You, you rush a project to completion. Um, along the way, the devs are like we're cutting corners, we're cutting corners, we're cutting corners. And then from like a managerial perspective, you're like, yeah, I get it. I get it. We're cutting corners. Um, this is what you always say. And, and, um, we're going to be it's always fine. Yeah. It's really fine. Um, until it's not. And then, and then when the thing blows up 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, uh, because we've been cutting corners for three years, who's, who's in there fixing that? Um, and who's feeling all the stress of fixing that? Right. And, and like, who's to blame? And it's the developers, it's the ops guys, it's whoever put that together. And, mm -hmm. and there's, this, there's this combination of, yeah, maybe they should have built it better, but sometimes you just don't have the, you don't have the room to do that. And, um, and, and honestly, developers, at least the ones I've worked with, they, um, they want to do things, uh, they want to serve you. Um, so they, they're oftentimes actually high S as well. And they want, um, they want to make you happy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when, when things are going poorly, they take it upon themselves and, um, and they honestly feel guilty about the fact that the thing, this thing is failing, even though it's as much a process problem as it is a, as a technology problem, because we never came back to shore up some of these things that, um, uh, that we, we've been talking about for such a long time. And look, so here's the thing too with developers is we spend our time, we spend most of the majority of our day kind of like geared into the screen, right. and which is we, what's, what we're being paid to do. And, and um, our communication is with a terminal and we're typing things. Um, we're not building the skill sets that maybe like a marketing person has in terms of, of the interpersonal interactions. And so there's this atrophy communication muscle. And, and so then what happens is um, there's a problem, there's a thing that needs to get fixed. And um, it's very, very clear to the developer that it needs to be fixed, um, but they don't know how to express it. Right. And, it comes, and it comes across as frustration or, or, um, or as a, you know, a kind of a troublemaker or something like that. And really, really this, the, the issue is they just don't, they don't, they don't have the right skill set to, um, to express these things to you as a, as a leader. And it's your job as a leader to listen to what they're saying uh, rather than expecting that, oh, the, it's just like one of my sales guys and like he can totally explain this to me. Um, right. they, they literally can't sometimes. Interesting. So, yeah. So, I mean, what do you say, what do you say to a developer who has kind of gone from project to project and they've been all failures? Uh, like, because <laughs> this is a, so this they, is a highly possible outcome, right? But so the, the project that they're on, um, so uh, failed projects, failed projects, personal projects and corporate projects. Well, uh, Sometimes it may be you. <laughs> uh, so you, you need to you need to understand why they failed. Um, uh, most times it's a process problem, and um, and you can't take it too personally. But uh, but if there's a long string of failures.